Well, he chose the background music and a great choice as well. And he's chosen his five favourite cricketers, uh, those who influenced him in his early years and uh, then helped him to become the cricketer that he was and a very fine cricketer too. Alex Tudor, uh, thank you very much indeed for the work that you've done here and uh, and for the, your choice of, of music there. It was a brilliant package, a wonderful choice. Let's start then with your earliest influences. Um, who are the who are your idols that uh, you remember looking up to and thinking, I want to be him? Yeah, I mean, listen, I I grew up in a, a West Indian household. Mum, and Dad, I'm um, from Barbados, so the early early years were very much Sir Clive Lloyd era, and then Sir Vivian Richards, and then the players that were in that team. So you're talking about Malcolm Marshall. For me, I I call him the goat um, purely because he could do it on any wicket, any situation. He could mix his pace up. He didn't have to bowl express pace all the time. He he read conditions really well. Certain wickets, he he knew that he didn't have to run in at ninety mile an hour. He could just run up, change the angles on the crease, which he did. And he was he was a thinking bowler. You know, he used to try and think batsmen out, and he did. He could turn it on when he wanted. He could bowl quick. He could hit you on the head. He could hit you on the toe. But also he could, you know, bowl at low 80s and just nip it around and make sure that you couldn't put bat on it. So, you know, and he did that all around around the world. He didn't do it just when he came to England on friendly conditions. He did it in Australia, went to India, I think, in six test matches and got 36 wickets. So that's, you know, an average at 24, 22, I think Gerard told me. So... You know, he was an outstanding bowler. So as a young black man, in a black boy in, in, in South London and, and seeing it on terrestrial TV and, and watching and seeing the West Indies playing with flair and sort of seeing people that I can identify with and, and doing it very well um, was something to aspire to. And, you know, I can t- you know, you got, as I said, Malcolm Marshall, you know, Joe Garner, Curtly Ambrose is another one. I mean, you know, you, I sort of saw myself in him a little bit, obviously being tall. I remember he came over in his first tour here in 1988. Okay, we're moving on to number two now. Oh. Okay. Curtly, Elkon, Linwell, Ambrose. Now, Sir Curtly from the Village mm. of Sweets. Okay, we'll get, come back to Malcolm Marshall, but we're on to Sir Curtly now. He, he I just remember in, in 88, watching that series and he sort of burst onto the scene uh, he, and he didn't have a, a massive background because he loved basketball. He wanted, you know, being six foot nine or whatever he is, you know, he, he, he loved playing basketball and that's what he did. But obviously someone saw something in when, once he got a ball in his hand and then just the way he came in with those high knees and bowling, he had that sort of flick of the wrist before he delivered and he just used to get the ball to go through chest high and, you know, Jeff do John be behind the stumps and he'd be hitting his gloves hard and, you know, Viv be riling him up and getting really excited he just caused problems and I just sort of saw myself in him really and he used to just bowl very well he's where he used to pitch it as well it wasn't like someone who could bowl quick and he sprayed it around it was very accurate you know what about his character his on-field persona the fact that he never said anything no. and uh, was I mean he was just super super cool and uh, I, mean, yeah, I think you were a little bit more emotional. You wore your emotions a bit more. Your heart on your sleeve compared to him. Well, you say that. But I remember Duncan Fletcher always said I, I was too nice as a fast bowler. I mean, I, I mean, my dad taught me, and I quote my dad a exactly. lot. Exactly. You smiled. I smiled. Curtly and, never did. Uh, but I, well, he didn't smile, but you never knew, did you, with him? He, he let the ball do the talking. And my dad was the same. He was saying, let the ball do the talking. Because there's nothing more embarrassing if you're getting hit all around the ground and you're still chirping makes no sense you know and I remember Mike Hafferton always saying he would always stare down the bowler because at the end of the day the bowler's got to turn away and go back to his mark so you would always win that battle you know the game's got to go on so I didn't see any point in all those histrionics or anything just let the ball do the work and I wasn't like I wasn't like him where there was no emotion you know the odd time you'd, you'd be frustrated and you would say something but I, I, I've seldom said anything to the batter it was more through frustration a bit like when I spoke to the great Glenn McGrath saying, you know, what is it? And he said he did that to rile himself up if things were drifting or he wasn't bowling well, that's when he would start to get annoyed. But when he was bowling well, he didn't used to say anything either. You know, he just let the ball do the work. And as I said, I used to just watch him 
bowl curtly and just think, yeah, I want to do that. And when you're when I was younger playing for London schools and stuff, I used to try and bowl like all of them. I used to mimic. Cause that's what you used to do when you was a kid. You would mimic. And I would mimic him and I'd jump up and I'd have that little flick of the wrist and, and try and get the bounce that he used to extract. And, uh, you know, he was someone that excited me. When he got the ball in his hand, I always wanted to watch. And, uh, you know, I've been, I've been very lucky and blessed to have met him and talked to him and, and, and stuff like that. And, and his passion for the game and, you know, the knowledge that he has. You just want to learn from that. OK, another fast bowler was an, an early idol or an influence, Wakar Yunus. Darren Goff also uh, had him on his list of five influential cricketers. I think any fast bowler in our era uh, who, who was growing up, for me, Wakar Yunus has to be on that list. He burst onto the scene. He was breaking toes, hitting people on the head, bowling extremely fast from a ridiculously long run-up. I mean, his run-up was, was like the great Michael Holding. You know, it was from the boundary and he came in he, and it was smooth though, but it was quick. And he used to get up and that foot used to get up a little bit like, say, Patrick Patterson. And he just used to propel that ball extremely quickly. And uh, especially in ODI cricket to start off with, he, he, I mean, it was embarrassing. He was just cleaning out the top order and lower order for, for fun. No one really wanted to get their toes in the way. And he just made it exciting, you know, seeing someone bowl at that pace. And seeing stumps regularly getting hit because sometimes he used to take the wicket out of the equation. You know, bowling in, in Asian conditions, sometimes it was flat. But that didn't matter for him because once he got that ball reversing, he, he's just trying to hit you on the head or he's trying to hit you on the toe. And um, and he was phenomenal. Before the injuries um, that he got quite early on, but when he burst onto the scene, he, he, he was something to watch. And I was hoping when I signed my contract at Surrey, he was meant to come over as the overseas player but sadly he got he got injured and I was absolutely gutted Ben and I who signed at the same time we were so excited um when we when we went to Australia pre-season saying oh yeah Wakar Yunus is coming and then he didn't and we were like oh you know just to be in a change room with him pick his brain see see him live uh running in would have been something but yeah I, you know watching him back in the day excited me I, I grew up in an area in, in Ellsford I had a lot of Pakistani friends and 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 and, and we're still you know still there my club Spencer we're community in a, a community there and and we did round our, our estate at the pitch we all try and bowl like Waka I mean I was six foot f- exactly. four and I'm trying to bowl like him and he's a short he's a short well, dude well exactly so Darren Goff they're both five foot ten and you know Goff you could see Oh, I can bowl like that. I can. I can do that. He saw the reverse swing, but you're six five. Yeah. You, so you're thinking? Were, were you aware that you were never going to be able to bowl those? Well, not quite like it, but I, I would try. I tell you, there'd be games when I was playing as a youngster, and I'd try and bowl like Kirtley. I'd try and bowl like Ian Bishop. I'd try and bowl like Wackar, and you just try all these things out. Um, but they, 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 they're the individuals that excited me, and, and Wackar units for me. I remember. Um, the Sunday league and they could only bowl from like eight and nine paces mm. and to try and get his run up in he used to like go on a circle and then come in and run in and bowl the reference assurance league I think it was um, back in the day if people can remember and, and just seeing him do that used to make me laugh but yeah he was he was a sight to behold the short run ups were an absolute delight when they to try and speed the game up and fit the overs into the allotted time absolutely brilliant it was never going to work but it was fun watching it Brian Charles Lara is also on your list yeah, I, I was telling the lads yesterday, uh, you know, off 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 air, and and just saying I was I was we were blessed and lucky. We were the first English team to go to South Africa um, after the apartheid. So in ninety two three, we went out to South Africa, and um, West Indies were were touring there, and there was a one day game in Bloemfontein, and I remember seeing Alan Donald who I'd seen before in 90 when I was playing at Warwickshire on their nursery ground and my old coach said, you need to go and watch this. Thing. There's a bowler you need to go and watch. If you want to aspire to bowl fast, you need to go and watch him. They call him White Lightning and watch him. But anyway, Brian Lara was batting then with just the helmet, with the earpieces, no go, no, no grill, nothing. And uh, Alan Donald and, you know, bowlers alike. Merrick Pringle possibly at that time and Snell, Richard Snell and those guys were steaming in and he got 100 not out and I remember just standing it was unbelievable because I'm standing you know square onto the wicket and you're thinking it's not a great place to see 
to watch when you're watching fast bowling. You're seeing the keeper. Uh, it would have been Richardson, wouldn't it? Um, he was miles back. But Brian Lara was like playing a different game. He, it was phenomenal, that high bat lift, if everyone can remember, that sort of jump across. And just, you know, I can't say flaying it, but it was, it was very deliberate. And he, he could just manipulate the ball, you know. He, he wouldn't hit the same ball the same way twice. He would just maybe angle the bat and it would go a certain way and he'd get up over that. If I, you know, remember how Gordon Greenwich used to play his pull shots with his leg up in the air and, and Lara used to do that as well. And he just had every shot, be it fast bowling, he can deal with it. Spin, he can deal with it. And he just made the game look so graceful when he was at the crease. And I remember when I was younger, if he got out, I turned the TV off. <laughs> and my dad used to have a go at me. He goes, no, cricket ain't done. I'm like, it is. He's the only guy that makes it look sexy for me when he's batting, you know, being left-handed and, and making it look elegant. And I used to just love watching him bat. And, and obviously the career he had, he batted for a long time. So I used to watch a lot. And I was, well, I say lucky, I, I didn't get to bolt him. Uh, <laughs> which would have been nice. I'm sure he would have he would have flayed me all over the place. But he, he was, he, he just made me excited about batsmanship, the way he went about it, the dominance and you think about all the great bowlers that bowled him, McGrath, Gillespie, Lee, Warren um, from Australia, you know, the English bowlers, Darren Goff and all these corky back in the day and stuff that were, were cleaning people up and getting a lot of wickets. And he just, like he was batting on a, on a different pitch, he just made it look so easy and, and so good. And for me, there's always a discussion of that era, Tendulkar, Lara, and depending on what way you go, you know, I would always say Lara, just, because Sasha's obviously up there. But for me, I just think he didn't have the calibre of players to follow, where, you know, Sasha had that, that five, that group of five. Lara, it was literally him and Sash, uh, and Chanderpool in, in, in the latter stages, and, and obviously a young Sarwan. But, so he had to sort of do it on his own a little bit. And the games that he took West Indies over the line, whew, I mean, that innings, that one five three, I think, not out at Barbados against Australia and and I remember the 277 as well uh, Sydney I think it was against Australia for me that innings is better than the 3 the 375 and definitely better than the 400 that 277 against that calibre of bowling you know I'm thinking Craig McDermott you know and, and, and these guys Shane Warne obviously he, he took them apart he did. He was ahead of his time as a cricketer. A man who was uh, ahead of his time as a cricketing leader was uh, one of your captains, your most influential captain, Adam Holyoke. What was it about him that... Uh, Goffey also mentioned a captain. Nasser Hussain had a big influence on his career. But what was it that uh, you'll always remember or be grateful for Adam Holyoke's leadership? Oh, unbelievable. He's like my big brother. I have a big brother, but he's like my other big brother, cricketing big brother. I love him to death. Um, and I suppose when I look back, you, you sort of think he wasn't sort of captain material, really. He was, a, he was, you know, not say he was a rebel, but you know, he he didn't really like authority. Um, he he would, was one of the lads with, it, and yet all the lads looked up to him. Yeah, massive. Well, a they were scared of him because he could beat all of us up. <laughs> um, because people who don't know Adam, he liked his boxing, and obviously after cricket, he went to MMA and professional bots and he, he knew how to look after himself and he, he liked to tear up and let's just put it like, like if there was if you were in trouble you need Adam you would want Adam Hollyoak with you and so the lads would never sort of cross him that way so he had that respect straight away but once you know Alec was busy with England and stuff like that, obviously we were looking for a captain and, and he went to Australia with that A side and did extremely well and came back with a lot of a lot of points you know everyone was thinking oh he's the next one he's going to be the next captain and he just I don't know he, he got quite deep he was reading all sort of books Gandhi books and, uh, and all sorts and just to sort how he's going to better himself and he the one thing I say is as a leader he would never ask anyone in the team to do anything that he weren't willing to do himself you know sometimes if the game was drifting which it really didn't under his uh, his captaincy but he was like give me the ball I'll get the wicket. I'll do something. If there was a tricky situation with the bat, I'll do it. I'll go and do it. If there was a place in the field, especially Osaki and Souls, and you think, well, I ain't field in there, he would do it. Um, so you'd run for a brick wall for him. And I wouldn't say he was a tactical genius, but 
he was like a bit like not saying like like Ben Stokes, but he would never let the game drift. He always backed you. No fear. Whatever way you feel is best for you to make an impact within this side, you go and do that. He used me the best. He never was going to bowl me in, a, in long spells. He's like, Chudes, we need a wicket. I need you to come on, bowl as fast as you can for four or five overs, and then you're going to have a rest. Don't worry about it. We've got people that can bowl long spells, your big nulls and stuff like that. I need you for this situation. He did not care if I went for 30 or five, but the wicket column was important. And don't, that was massive for me. Don't don't shy away from the comparison with Ben Stokes because I think that it's perfectly apt. I mean, he wasn't as talented a cricketer as Ben Stokes by any means, uh, but he maximised the talent that he had. And I think that in many ways his attitude was, you know, twenty years. He was twi- he was Ben Stokes twenty years earlier. Yeah, he he worked extremely hard in his game. He always says that you know Ben was the, the naturally gifted one within the family. But he worked extremely hard. You know, people don't know Adam was a fast bowler in his younger years. And then he had a serious back injury and he sort of had to recreate himself, really. And he, he worked extremely hard on his batting and he ended up averaging 40 in first class cricket. People don't know, you know, and that's no mean feat in that era at that time with the bowlers that are around in county cricket. He had a really good career and he worked extremely hard. You know, the hardest man working in the gym fitness train anything like that he would make sure he had that competitive edge he always wanted to win and as you say as a leader I mean yes he had some good bowlers um, and and he always says you know a captain's only as good as his bowlers that he has at his disposal when he had some good ones you know and um, but he he just the game was always moving forward with him he would do some things that we would think what are you doing but you know he would declare you know, with 240, you're thinking, but, you know, he, he said, well, I've had a conversation with Saki. He says, we got enough with Sakale Mushda. He, and he'll pull out and Bicknell, sort of old school thing. No, 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 we need 300 plus. He's like, no, 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 we're coming off. And he'll like clap and bring them off. And you're thinking, oh my gosh. But, you know, he had that backing from the guys and he, he was phenomenal. Phenomenal leader, great for Surrey, did well with England. Um, and as you say, I'm forever grateful. He's, he's, as I say, he's my big brother. Love him to death. And you know, when he comes to England, he, he literally stays with us. I'm so worried about running out of time. We've never got enough time to do this. But there are a couple of points that I, I want to make sure that we squeeze in. Uh, the first is that um, you were unable to limit yourself to five, although you only got five in uh, the caps in the um, overlay uh, at the beginning. Uh, including yourself, I have to bring Graham Dilley in here because he's your sixth and um, and he's a personal favourite of, of many people, sadly no longer with us, but you, you had to have him in your five, six. I, I was ve- I, in my career, sometimes, you know, people say you're lucky with either who you play with, people you meet, etc., etc. I was very lucky. Ben and I were very lucky to have Graham Dilley as our bowling coach at Surrey when we first went. He was unbelievable, like, loveliest bloke in the world. Knew the game, but he just knew, it's like he knew how to deal with young, fast bowlers, and he had two in in Ben and I. And he just never complicated it for me. He was like, shoot, just running the bowl fast. If you get hit because you've bowled too short, you'll soon learn to pitch it up. If you're bowling on the batter's and leg and he keeps clipping you on the leg side, you just soon learn to bowl outside. And it was sometimes, you know, you can overthink the game. He just simplified it. And all he wanted was for Ben and I to just run in and bowl quick, let the batsman jump up on the crease and, and stuff like that. And, and I, I tell you, when, when we used to have the indoor nets, no one wanted to bat when, 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 when you had indoor nets during the winter because he would bowl from about 18 yards. He still had that drag pull if everyone, you know, people... You know, listeners can remember how Graham Dilly used to bowl very close to the wicket at an angle, but he had that drag with that back foot. And he was just a very strong, powerful man, just naturally just powerful, very strong. And then in an indoor net, it used to hit the back net. It was like, Doof! and he used to like want to bowl it around your head and stuff like that. So there wasn't too many. Adam obviously would go on back because that's how he was. But I'll tell you, you know, Ali Brown players like, nope. No, let's have some throwdowns, please. No, not doing that. Uh, but he was frightening indoors, and he was just a lovely bloke. Filled in was a nightmare because he could hit the ball so far, and you hit it up and try and hit the clouds, and you you literally had to catch free and go in. 
And I remember it, there was a day at Old Trafford where it was literally tubes, catch free going. Well, it took me about 20 minutes. My, my toys came out and he just sent me in. And I was like, I'm going anyway. And it was like, it would literally had me running from side to side, coming in, going back. And I just, I, I couldn't get my paws on it for about 20 minutes. Uh, it was one of my memories that, that will stay with me. Lads were crying. I think he had a little giggle as I was walking off sulking and he, like, his shoulders were going. But he just used to basically hit, stand there with like Jonathan Batty, who was the keeper, and just smoke the ball for miles. He could hit it so hard, so far, so high. Um, great guy. We miss him. Uh, what an unbelievable human being. What a career he had uh, as a coach. I know he's touched a lot of uh, young bowlers and cricketers, not just bowlers, but cricketers, went with his time at Loughborough University when he was in the county setup. He then came and, and, and did some work with England, and I was very lucky and blessed to have known him, known him as a coach, as a friend, um, and as a cricketer that I also in the 80s looking in, and I always remember speaking to Desmond Haynes saying, if he just pitched it up a fraction, he would have got 200 plus test wickets. Uh, Clive Lloyd was the same, said it. He, he just, because he bowled close to the wicket, and he had a beautiful away swinger. His, his length was just a little bit, a bit like what people said about Andrew Caddick, where it was a little bit a foot too short where it used to just beat the bat. If he went a little bit fuller, he would have got the Knicks. But what a bowler. And, and everyone can remember 1981, can't they? Oh, it's my favourite innings of all time is 56 and in support of Ian Botham. Um, thank you very much indeed, Alex Tudor. You're, you're five, you're six. Malcolm Marshall, Kirtley Ambrose, Wacko Eunice, Brian Lara, Adam Holyoke and uh, Graham Dilley. Brilliant, fantastic, thank you for your time. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.